I've requested that the administration provide this committee with monthly updates to make sure that we are on track with meeting our target, um, specifically when it comes to reconstructing infrastructure, understanding the capacity um, and the wherewithal of the um, recovery team. And then most importantly, a couple of things really, ensuring that community plugs in to the decision-making process, um, as well as because this is um, an unprecedented effort where we will be um, receiving tens of millions of dollars, ensuring that we have the right project management and financial management systems in place to track every single one of those recovery dollars. I'll try to quickly go through um, a status report. First item would be the status of temporary reconstruction. Two items under this. Highway 132 status of the temporary reconstruction there and the grants for private access roads. On Highway 132, uh, the deadline was ex extended to January 5th of 2020, which Public Works assures us that they will meet in order to qualify for the 100% reimbursement from Federal Highways. The upper section, which is this portion from where Highway 132 ended until the edge of the Kipuka. That upper section, approximately 8,700 feet. The paving is 100% complete. Shoulder, 100% complete. Signing and striping, the last remaining item, we will start in November. The lower section from here, the edge of Kipuka to four corners, approximately 7,900 feet and a short segment on Highway 137 connecting to Government Beach Road, about 1,100 feet. Paving 100% complete, but still too hot to drive on. Shoulder dressing, about 30% complete. And once that's complete, then they'll start on the signing and striping. So there'll be uh, the best estimate now from Public Works is possibly opening about Thanksgiving, at least the upper section, and they'll assess at that time whether the lower section is drivable. For the grants given for private driveway construction to access the Kipuka areas, three contracts have been issued totaling just under $50,000. So um, two of them, I believe, needed grading permits, which they secured, and one was under an acre, so they did not need a grading permit. Next item, status of outreach, communications, case management. So two speakouts were conducted. Speakout number one, July 27, speakout number two, October 5th, a survey was also conducted and the results are in the process of being compiled. Um, community networking, the HIDART is meeting every month. What they're working on is a needs assessment, tracking community resources and strengthening partnerships. Now there are a lot of um, lessons learned that we hope to take from this disaster and apply to future disasters to make us better prepared. And HIDART is one of those where hopefully it will be institutionalized, institutionalized so that the next disaster, the, the partnerships among the nonprofits and government will be quickly, can be quickly stood up and um, provide assistance. The website, will be the primary repository of information to the public. Case management contract has been executed with Neighborhood Place of Puna. An office has been opened and staff has been hired and trained. Status of pilot initiatives. Now pilots are kind of new programs where we're not sure how well they will work or we need to um, start figuring out how to roll it out on a on a broader scale. One of them is this Puna Strong Grant Program, which is a way for the community to um, help themselves with projects. So 
we'll be doing a, a request for proposals that will be coming out shortly, um, where we'll be hiring another nonprofit to be the one stop where the community can go and get either technical assistance, information on the grants, and this nonprofit will be administering all the different grant agreements. Housing assistance, two innovative ideas that we need to know better how to roll them out. One is the community land trust and the other is the revolving loan. So these will be done on a smaller scale first. The community development block grant is one of the major grants that we hope to receive. We have been kind of um, promised about 66.9 million, but that money doesn't become committed until the Federal Register. So the Federal Register kicks off the whole process. Once the Federal Register comes out, which it hasn't yet, we've been expecting it. First the feds told us July, then they said October, and we don't expect the October, possibly November, but anyway, whatever it, it happens. And it's a good thing maybe that it has been delayed because once it happens, we have to meet very strict deadlines and because we were anticipating in July, we actually have started the process already. So once the Federal Register is issued, 60 days from the Federal Register, we need to have this implementa implementation plan that I had mentioned with all the financial controls and the capacity assessment submitted to HUD for their review and approval to let them know that we are um, competent and ready to receive the money. 90 days from the Federal Register, we have to be ready with a draft action plan um, that will go out for public comment. 120 days from the Federal Register, we submit the action plan to HUD. And approximately 90 days from the time of submittal, HUD review and approve the action plan. Once the action plan is approved by HUD, then we enter into a grant agreement. We try to procure the system that we thought was going to work, which was smart sheets, but apparently there's a lot of problems in that procurement. Um, so what we will be trying to do is take the good features of that smart sheet system and see if we can tailor Excel or something, a program like that. Anyway, by the time this implementation plan becomes due, then for sure we need to have this thing figured out. But it's quite a um, complex system that we've been working on for months, trying to find the right software package that can manage not just the money, but the time. Um, and the time portion, we've been using Microsoft Project, which has been a pretty good system. I'm really bummed about Smartsheets. I really liked it. I'm just wondering, you know, we, you started to use that program, we fell in love with it, and then Corp Council down the road came in and said, oh, sorry, but we can't enter into agreement with, these, with this company. So can we start looping them in earlier on? I, I just get concerned that we're making a lot of really great decisions and then I don't know where Corp Council is in this. Yeah, no, that was um, a good call by them. You know, they had, they had to look at um, protecting our, it wasn't necessarily a procurement kind of problem. It was more like if we, if we had problems with them and we ended into litigation, there was some problems in terms of jurisdiction um, that we couldn't resolve with smart sheets. One reason why we want to make sure that all these systems and the, and the duplication of benefits and all those kind of technical detail requirements are put in place 
is because we want to avoid here where grants were given out, the government does their audit, finds mistakes, and they take the money back. That term is clawback, and that clawback is something we definitely want to avoid. Luckily, in this instance, we were able to provide additional information where people who received individual assistance in this disaster um, were able to work it with FEMA, where very few, just a handful, had to um, give money back to FEMA. And then for each of the RSFs, I just want to confirm what, the, what that structure looks like. Because when I met with um, Douglas and Diane previously, they had mentioned that for each of the RSFs, they would be co-chaired by someone from the community and potentially someone from county. So just wondering if you could elaborate on that and if, if this is set in stone or if there is room to expand to include more folks from the community. It is definitely fluid. So this is something that we can set up initially and as we see how it's working, we can adjust. Okay. make changes. Excellent. So the task force, we wanted to have it as a pretty um, defined body to make it efficient in terms of discussion and decision making. One of the things that I articulated earlier on was assisting Kuo'okala. And so it's been months and months and months since I've convened a conversation between Susie, Public Works, Fire, Planning, I think some other folks are at the table to figure out how we can get them a temporary certificate of occupancy so that they can get their charter status um, renewed. And so now I'm hearing that there might be issues within Corporation Council about making that happen. Um, so I'm wondering, is there being a concerted effort to develop like criteria for how we expend the recovery monies? The Puna Strong Grant Program. The reason why it's taken so long to roll that one out is because, exactly because of that. That we need, as we were trying to do the RFP for that grant, these, all these different questions have been coming up that um, is leading into a set of criteria that we need to um, further develop. And the Kuokala question is one of those factors that are being added to the set of criteria that we are developing. Okay, is that being developed by scratch or are we, learning on, are we leaning on other jurisdictions that have experienced natural disasters in the past? I feel like this is a place where FEMA can step in and provide that technical assistance and also make the connections to other municipalities that have may already articulated this sort of criteria. And so we can use that as a model and just tailor it based on our, our local code and state statutes. Mm, no, that the issues that we are facing in the criteria is not disaster specific. It's more like, how do you... Or recovery funding, I mean. How do you give money to a private entity. Right, and so I'm saying, don't you think other jurisdictions might have no, grappled with that in the past? It, it's, it's, it may be, but it's not just recovery money. It's any kind of grant that you may want to give, either to another nonprofit who would then be in charge of dispersing that further. I don't know if any recovery if it would take a lot of research if we confine ourselves to recovery to find that situation of a three-step kind of grant issuance where Corp Council found one, uh, another state that has done it. So we're looking at that as a model. The other one was the community land trust. You know, does it make sense to give money to a private homeowner, you know, is that a good use of, of um, public monies? Um, so that is more related to how you give housing assistance. So yeah, we're looking, but it's not FEMA who has the answers necessarily.